As a kid, you might have thought about what would happen if you plant trees in the desert. Or why can't you make the desert greener? Yes, of course, now you know it all depends on the climate and the geographical area. But as kids, we never thought about this logic and think what couldn't be possibly right. But now Saudi Arabia has made things possible. They are ready to turn a desert into green forest. Isn't this insane? You're watching The Unknown Facts. And if you are interested to see more alike videos, you know where you have to meet us next. Moving on with this video now. Talking about Saudi Arabia, the Middle Eastern Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is characterized by its extreme aridity and low population density. Saudi Arabia is a young country that has inherited a rich history from its ancestors and spans the majority of the northern and central parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Mecca and Medina, the two holiest towns in Islam, are located in the Hejaz region of Saudi Arabia, which is located in the country's western highlands along the Red Sea. This region is known as the Cradle of Islam. Nayid, which literally translates to highland, is located in the middle of the country and is characterized by its vastness and aridity. Nomadic tribes used to call this area home until quite recently. The country's vast oil reserves may be found to the east along the coast of the Persian Gulf. Ever since the 1960s, these fields have helped to establish Saudi Arabia as a synonym for petroleum wealth. These three factors, tribalism, untold wealth, and religion, have been the driving forces behind the following history of the country. It wasn't until the establishment of the Saud dynasty, Al Saud, the Najdi tribe after which the country is called, and its final consolidation of power in the early 20th century that Saudi Arabia started to take on the traits of a modern country. This occurred in the early 20th century. The austere style of Islam known as Wahhabism was accepted by the early leaders of the Saud family and went on to become the official doctrine of the Saudi Arabian state. This strict form of Islam was a major factor in the success of the Saud family. This profound religious conservatism has been complemented by pervasive tribalism, in which rival family groupings compete with one another for resources and position, which has frequently made Saudi society difficult for people from other cultures to appreciate. The enormous oil riches of Saudi Arabia have allowed for massive and quick investment in the country's infrastructure. Many citizens have profited from this expansion, but it has also financed luxurious lives for the scions of the royal family. Many individuals, both religious conservatives and liberal democratic politicians, have accused the family of squandering and mismanaging the country's wealth. Additionally, during the Persian Gulf War in 1990-91, there was a rise in civil unrest regarding the country's tight ties to the West which were most prominently exemplified by the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia up until 2005. Around the middle of the 20th century, the majority of Saudi Arabia still adhered to a traditional way of life that had hardly evolved in the previous few thousand years. Since then, the speed at which life is lived in Saudi Arabia has quickened significantly. The continuous flow of pilgrims to Mecca and Medina, vast crowds arrive for the annual Hajj, and more pilgrims visit throughout the year for the lesser pilgrimage the Umrah had always provided the country with contacts from the outside world. However, interaction with the rest of the world expanded as a result of innovations in transportation, technology, and organization. In addition to having an effect on the country's economy, Saudi Arabia's expanding oil wealth has had an irreparable impact on the country's educational and social systems. Through the importation of millions of foreign workers and the employment of hundreds of thousands of Saudis in atypical jobs, Modern production methods have been pushed on a society that has traditionally relied on more traditional means. While talking from the greenery point of view, there are a remarkable amount of native plant species that are able to survive in the severe environment. At this time, under the auspices of the Saudi Green Initiative, actions are being taken to maintain and even enhance the amount of vegetation that is present throughout the kingdom. The kingdom is home to a plethora of vegetation, including over 2,000 wild plant species that belong to 142 families. This vegetation may be found anywhere throughout the kingdom, from the desert landscapes in the north to the region of Asir in the south. However, the information provided by the Saudi National Center for Wildlife indicates that approximately 600 of these species are considered to be in endangered status, and 21 of them are maybe already extinct. With the goal of planting 450 million trees by the year 2030, the Sustainable Growth Initiative, which was unveiled in March 2021, is the largest afforestation initiative the country has ever seen. By the end of 2021, around 10 million trees would have been planted in each of the 13 areas that make up the kingdom. One might not immediately think of woods as a type of ecosystem that exists in Saudi Arabia. However, forests are an important part of the country's biodiversity. 
There are around 2.7 million hectares of woodland in the kingdom, the majority of which are located in the inaccessible highlands of Aba and Asir in the southwest. To say nothing of the intended greening of the desert, the target of planting 450 million trees may appear to be an unrealistic aim, especially in light of the rapid urban expansion that the kingdom is undergoing. But in point of fact, the Saudi government has established specific SGI goals to incorporate green spaces harmoniously into urban expansion, including parkland and afforestation within the limits of the kingdom's desert cities. These goals are intended to counteract the potential harm that could be caused by urban sprawl. The greening of unmanaged surfaces within these cities will not only help to slow the rise in temperature, but it will also help to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide, improve air quality, make it possible for people to lead more active lifestyles, and make cities more aesthetically pleasing in a manner that is environmentally responsible. In climates that are more rural, on the other hand, efforts to green the environment have to compete with the spread of deserts, dwindling water resources, and record-breaking temperatures. All of these factors are assumed to be the result of climate change that has been created by humans. In a nation where rainfall is sparse and groundwater is being depleted, the SGI roadmap aims to halt and reverse desertification and soil degradation, conserve the kingdom's one-of-a-kind biodiversity, and maintain the nation's limited water resources. These goals were established. There are currently 15 locations in Saudi Arabia that are protected because of the biodiversity they contain. Twelve of these areas are on land, and the remaining three are marine. It is proposed by the National Center for Wildlife to bring that total up to 75, with 62 occurring on land and 13 being in coastal and marine environments. The King Salman Royal Nature Reserve is located in the north of Saudi Arabia and encompasses around 6% of the total land area of the kingdom. It is home to around 300 different animal species as well as rare archaeological heritage sites some of which date back to as far as 8,000 BC. The environment varies from mountainous to broad plains and high plateaus. A recent initiative by the Reserve's Authority and partners to contribute to SGI's goals saw the planting of 100,000 seedlings with the assistance and participation of volunteers in conjunction with Maden. This was a collaborative effort by the Reserve's Authority and partners. We are committed to increasing the vegetation cover, as we have already achieved in planting 600,000 plants as well as having many seed sowing campaigns to increase the vegetation in the reserve, a spokesperson for the KSRNR told Arab News. We have already had many seed sowing campaigns to increase the vegetation in the reserve. The trees and shrubs are perennial plants that help to rebuild the habitats that have been damaged by the desert. These plants are native to the desert ecosystems and have adapted to the harsh conditions that are typical of the desert, such as the lack of rainfall and extreme heat. They do not require an excessive amount of water for irrigation. Establishing a seedling program at the reserve is one of the reserve's strategic goals. This goal encompasses a wide range of projects, including the construction of the primary nursery. Despite this, water continues to be a significant obstacle to environmental protection efforts and greening initiatives throughout the kingdom. Digging freshwater wells was one way that people who lived on the Arabian Peninsula over the centuries managed to maintain their way of life and make it through periods of drought. In the course of time, and particularly in the aftermath of the economic boom that hit the kingdom in the 1970s, Saudi shifted their focus to modern farming practices, progressively drawing on groundwater supplies. Because Saudi Arabia does not have any rivers or natural lakes, and because it receives relatively little annual rainfall to replenish its sources, the country built saltwater desalination plants in its eastern and western coastal areas in order to provide drinking water to towns located inland. Despite this, there is an increasing need for fresh water while natural aquifers are quickly running out of water. Therefore, the Saudi government is looking into ways to preserve its water resources and use them in a more efficient manner so that it can continue to meet the demands of an expanding economy while also keeping green spaces well watered. According to Maria Nava, a scientific consultant for Greening Arabia at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology Center for Desert Agriculture, the SGI's strategic team is likely to tap into treated wastewater in order to irrigate newly planted vegetation. Nava made this statement in an interview with Arab News. She also mentioned another objective, which is to limit rainfall loss to the sea or through sand infiltration by implementing and improving water harvesting in the kingdom and remediating soil for water retention wherever it is required. According to Nava, plants that thrive in mountain, wadi, and desert climates typically require far more water and canopy cover in order to give shade than plants that grow in urban settings do. 
This flora demands more water compared to desert trees, which are resistant to drought and have fewer leaves, she continued. This vegetation also has more stems and branches. Given the very geography of the kingdom, a significant amount of work will be required to restore arid or semi-arid regions, stop soil erosion, retain water, cultivate using permaculture techniques, and plant vegetation that is tolerant to local conditions, including the increased risk of dust storms. Every region in the kingdom is important, and it is our policy to treat them as such, Nava explained. Each action zone has been subjected to in-depth research and analysis to determine its potential for tree growth, water availability, and aftercare of the vegetation. Within the parameters of each zone, the propositions are founded on the idea that they will be sustainable and that the vegetation will be able to be preserved and improved in the years to come. It is not that some receive more care than others, rather it is more than some have a better potential to host vegetation than others due to factors such as the weather, the availability of water, the soil, and the topography. However, it is important to keep in mind that any modifications made to an ecosystem will have ripple effects on other aspects. Each tactic has undergone extensive planning in order to ensure its long-term viability. Saudi Arabia is re-evaluating its approach to water conservation as a result of the pressing need to do so. Because of the SGI's lofty goals and the amount of energy that would be required to achieve them, it was suggested that instead of using desalinated water for irrigation, treated water should be used instead. According to Nava, desalination requires significantly more energy than the treatment of wastewater. Since the water quality is suitable for irrigation, it is conceivable to recycle all of the wastewater for that purpose, and there are already plans in place for this to take place in the kingdom. In the present day, there is already some reuse of treated wastewater, and according to the National Water Policy, the reuse of treated wastewater will reach 70% by 2030, with plans to raise this percentage in the near future. Communities all throughout the kingdom are beginning to take a more active role in the SGI's efforts to realize its aims and establish a greener future, as the nation as a whole is becoming more aware of the natural bounty it possesses. The communities are the base for all of the projects to become genuine and thrive, said Nava. The communities are the foundation. It is of the utmost importance to engage and involve the people, listen to their needs, learn their customs, and incorporate them into the decision-making process. It is imperative that the execution of the SGI be founded on these three fundamental pillars, the social, the economic, and the sustainable. That's all for the video today. If you enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.